is October 31st. Really, Reformation Day. And welcome to Matt and Randy in the mornings. Yes. We are now live, and we're getting ready to go on a Jeep ride. Yes, that's that's why we have our, our Jeep clothes, trail ride clothes on this morning. Taking some people to Ocala National Forest. Yeah. So. But we have to be up to Altoona a little before so 9 o'clock. We're going to try to get these devotions quickly done. But I'm going to do a lot of reading today because that kind of keeps me on in line. <laughs> so here we go. On October 31st, 1517. An obscure monk named Martin Luther, and we forgot to pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, anoint your word. <laughs> yes, so Lord, we pray. Anoint you, uh, Randy's reading, anoint the, the word, God, as it penetrates our hearts, and yes, let our Holy hearts Spirit. be fertile ground for the seed of your word, that it might help us truly live victoriously in Christ. Yes. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, October 31st, 1517, that's 503 years ago, an obscure monk named Martin Luther. Desiring to spark theological discussion over the medieval practice of selling indulgences, um, nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. That happened 503 years ago. By challenging the church's authority and its doctrine, Luther reclaimed for Christianity the central doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Luther took a bold and dangerous step as he nailed the paper to the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. Morning. Done, Scylla. I'm fixing the camera. It says, in Martin Luther's own words, this is what he said. He said, I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God, in Romans 1.17. Morning, Richard. It says, because I took it to Rick. mean that... Justice whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust. My situation was that although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage me him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Yet, I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. This is what Romans, I'm going to start with verse 15 through 18 says. Romans 1, 15 through 18 says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Luther remarked that he had, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back over here, otherwise I'm going to get sidetracked. So he read that and it kept bothering him. And then he says, then I grab says the dress that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn, to have gone through open doors in paradise. The whole of scripture took a new meaning. And whereas the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gate of heaven. You see, the purgatory, um, the, the Catholic pushed purgatory. They pushed this thing that if you paid them a certain amount of money, the Pope could make it so that someone gets released of purgatory. I'm going to read a little bit more about that in a moment. 
It says, during his early years, whenever Luther read what would become the famous Reformation text, Romans 1.17, his eyes were drawn not to the word faith, but to the word righteousness. Who, after all, could live by faith? Who, after all, could live by faith but those who were already righteous? The text was clear on the matter. The righteous shall live by faith. Luther remarked, excuse me, I'll keep my pages in order here. Okay. On the heels of this new understanding came others. To Luther, the church was no longer the institution defined by apostolic secessions. Instead, it was a community of those who had been given faith. Salvation came not by the sacraments as such, but by faith. The idea that human beings had a spark of goodness enough to, enough to seek out God was not a foundation of theology, but was taught only by fools. Humility was no longer a virtue that earned grace, but a necessary response to the gift of grace. Faith no longer consisted of assenting to the church's teachings, but of trusting the promises of God and the merits of Christ. It wasn't long before the revolution in Luther's heart and mind played itself out in all of Europe. There's something he wrote. It's called, Here I Stand. It says, It started on All Saints' Eve, 1517, when Luther publicly objected to the way preacher John Tetzel was selling indulgences. These were documents prepared by the church and bought, okay, bought by individuals either for themselves or on behalf of the dead that will release them from punishment due to their sins. As Tetzel preached, once the coin in the coffer clings, a soul from purgatory heavenward springs. So it was being taught that you could pay your way out of you know, the punishment of your sins. Luther questioned the church's trafficking in indulgences and called for a public debate of 95 theses he had written. Instead, his 95 theses spread across Germany as a call to reform, and the issue quickly became not indulgences, but the authority of the church. Did the Pope have the right to issue indulgences? Events quickly accelerated. A public debate at Leipzig in 1519 when Luther declared that a simple layman armed with the scriptures was superior to both Pope and councils without them. He was threatened to excommunication. I'm going to read to you a little bit about what oh, where am I here? Uh, what indulgences were. Here we go what he meant by these indulgences. This is what was really bothering him. It says, bind it, this is what they believe. This is what that the gentleman was preaching. Buying indulgences gives people a false sense of security and endangers their salvation. So this is, now comes Luther and says, no, what you're saying is not true. And instead, it is dangerous for people. You cannot buy your way from punishment for your sin. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ, is what now he had come to the understanding. So he said, this is one of his points that he was saying, it says, buying indulgences gives people a false sense of security and endangers their salvation. Indulgences are positively harmful to the recipient because they impede salvation by diverting charity and inducing a false sense of security. Christians should be taught that he who gives to the poor is better than he who receives a pardon. He who spends money on indulgences instead of reli reliving want, want receives not the indulgence of the Pope, but the indignation of God. In other words, him who spends money on those things, he who is paying their way to the priest to get no punishment for their sin, instead they were getting the indignation of God. Because there's only one way, and this is, through, again, through Jesus Christ. He says, 
Indulgences are most pernicious because they induce complacency and thereby imperil salvation. Those persons are damned who think that letters of indulgence make them certain of salvation. God works by contraries so that man feels himself to be lost in the very moment when he is on the point of being saved. Man must first cry out that there is no health in him. He must be consumed with horror. This is the pain of purgatory. And in this disturbance, salvation begins when man believes himself to be utterly lost. Light breaks. Peace comes in the word of Christ through faith. He who does not have this is lost even though he be absolved a million times by the Pope. And he who does have it and he who does have it may not wish to be released from purgatory. For true contrition seeks penalty. Christians should be encouraged to bear the cross. He had a new revelation. He understood that it wasn't going to be by works. That it was because of what Christ did. You know, a layman's definition of righteousness is this. Right standing with God. Righteousness is a condition of being in right relationship with the Lord. This can only happen through total faith and dependence upon Christ. There is no other way and there is nothing we can add to our faith to obtain right relationship with the Lord. One of the things that blinds people to a true understanding of the righteousness of righteousness is confusion about how we become right in the sight of God. It is commonly thought that our actions are the determining factor in God's judgment of our righteousness. That's not true. There is a relationship between our actions and our right standing with God. But right relationship with God produces actions, not the other way around. That is to say, we are not made righteous by what we do. Righteousness is a gift that comes from the Lord to those who accept what Jesus has done for them by faith. Romans 5, 17 through 18 says this, For it is by the offense of the one death reigned through the one, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace of the gift of the righteous reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Through Adam's sin came in, but through Jesus Christ we have the forgiveness of that sin. So, ne so then, this is verse 18, So then, as through one offense the result was condemnation to all mankind, so also through the act of righteousness, the result was justification of life to all mankind. The gift of salvation produces a changed heart that in turn changes our actions. Actions cannot change our hearts. It's the heart of man that God looks upon. 1 Samuel 16.7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his statue, because I have rejected him. For God does not see man as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And we must be righteous in our hearts to truly worship God. John 4, 23 through 26, this is God, uh, Jesus talking to the, the woman at the well. It says, But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the people, for such the people, uh, for such the people Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. Jesus is speaking to you right now. He's speaking to us. You know, Matthew and I do the things that we do, not because we're trying to get salvation, but we do it because we love the Lord, because we understand what he did for us.
as you go through your day today if you're in the United States Halloween is a big thing you know don't think on that just think on what Martin Luther found how through Christ we have peace through Christ we're justified we don't have to carry the burdens of our sin because Christ took care of it all we have to do is surrender our lives to Jesus Christ make him Lord of your life don't just say that you believe in Jesus and that's it because when you love someone your actions change you want to do things to please that person so if you truly love the Lord your life should be showing it by what you do for him the way you live your life so keep a praise song in your heart rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice keep us up in prayer as we go out on the trails today um, and share the love of Jesus with those around us and enjoy the beauty his creation reveals who he is blessings to all of you we love you see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock <laughs>